Hi, this is our second lecture on carbon based manufacturing and in this lecture I am going to talk about bottom up manufacturing which means we take carbon nano materials hmm, and then we make something out of them. Okay, so first of all forget about carbon materials or carbon nano materials. What exactly is a nano material? Hmm. You know that any nano material let's say you see it under the transmission electron microscope you see that there is a particle and diameter is 20 nanometers okay now can you actually pick that particle using a you know tweezer or something like that and you can manufacture something out of, out of it the answer is no because nanomaterials are so small that you cannot really use them individually or it's extremely difficult to use them individually okay so how do we work with nanomaterials or first of all what are exactly nanomaterials so there are some examples you can have nanoscale particles you can have nanoscale tubes you can have fibers you can have many you can have conical shapes you can have anything which is in the nanoscale as long as its dimensions are smaller than 100 nanometer we call them a nano structure and when we have a collection of these nano structures millions of them and then what they look like they look like a powder Hmm. So each nanoparticle, nano unit, nano structure is now like a particle in your powder. Hmm. So this powder in bulk is called carbon nanomaterial. Also the individual structures can be called carbon nanomaterial. But this is basically the idea is that we have a lot of things in our surroundings that are in the nanoscale. Hmm. But we did not make them intentionally. So when we make something intentionally with very good control over its properties as well as size then we call that material a nanomaterial and then we call the technology also nanotechnology and when we use these nanomaterials for technological applications altogether this is called nanotechnology the idea however is that you did not just somehow achieve the nanoparticle you intentionally you knew that what is the size that you want to make what are the properties that you want to have in these particles what is the process you know how um, it was constructed in that case this is nano i mean you can also for example if i dissolve salt into water and then there are na ions and cl minus ions these ions are also in the nano scale there are a lot of uh, viruses that are in the nano scale there are a lot of things that do exist that are in the nano scale but we don't call them a part of nanotechnology nanotechnology is what we intentionally do okay so as this is clear that nanoscale materials are typically prepared by bottom up approaches now this is not always the case however you can also prepare for example carbon fibers sometimes you can even buy electro spinning you can get nanoscale fibers so it's not impossible to use top down approaches but bottom up approaches work better in the case of nanomaterials because you have more control over the properties because you see something that is so small just a few nanometers it's better if it is atomically deposited Hmm. In that case, you can get better control over the properties. Okay, so um, now if you want to make something out of these uh, these particles or these nanostructures, nanomaterials, what do you do? As I said, you have a powder, and what you can do is you can use anything that you use with the powders. Hmm. Powders will be slightly different than the particles that you have, uh, you know, for example, in powder metallurgy, because there the powder size or the particle size is typically in the micro scale. Hmm. Nanoscale particles or structures are much, much, much smaller. So they have different surface properties. They have too much surface area hmm, compared to their volume. So their behavior is also slightly different. Hmm. So in that case, for any specific carbon nanomaterials, here we will be talking about carbon materials, but for any specific nanomaterial, you need to understand the surface properties you need to understand sometimes the melting temperature of the nanoparticle will be different compared to what you have for the bulk. Hmm. So various physical and sometimes also chemical properties will be different compared to what you have for the bulk of the same material. So copper nanoparticles versus, you know, bulk copper. So you will have differences in the properties. But once you know these differences, hmm, then basically you can treat it as any other powder and you can use powder based techniques now in most cases what happens is you will mix these powders into some sort of resin hmm. or another option is that you can just grow the films of a certain nanomaterial hmm. because ultimately you're growing them using bottom-up technique right 
So you can just take the substrate where you finally wanted your structure and just grow them. You can then also selectively grow them. So I made patterns using phot uh, photolithography, for example, on a silicon wafer, and I leave some squares out. Hmm. Only in those squares, then my um, then I deposit the catalyst and I can grow the material using uh, CVD techniques. So there are a lot of these things that you can do to play with the nanomaterials, but ultimately you're treating it as a powder. The most common technique still remains printing where you mix the nanomaterial with a binder. Okay, so now coming to the carbon-based nanomaterials. So you must have heard a lot of names, right? You definitely have heard the name graphene. Hmm. You have heard the name carbon nanotubes. Fullerenes also, nowadays I think they also included in the 12th standard textbooks, fullerenes in addition to uh, diamond graphite. So you have heard these names, carbon nanoparticles also. And then there are many other names. Every day we are coming up with new carbon materials. So there are many other names that you've heard in the context of carbon nanomaterials. But how do they look like? You know that sp2 carbon sheet has a lot of this honeycomb-like structure. Honeycomb structure means you have a lot of hexagons connected. Now, if you take one such layer, hmm, on top of that you put another layer, on top of that you put another layer, and, and so on. Now, these layers, if they are organized in A, B, A, B, A fashion, which means, okay, I have my own graphene. So, if you have, let's say this one, and the next graphene which you have under it, hmm, it's corner atom of the next graphene and the center atom of this one if they are aligned hmm. so this and then right here comes the second one so the center of this one and the corner of the one in the bottom if they are aligned and this continues that stack is then known as graphite but when you're talking about graphene then you have such sheets similar sheets but they are randomly organized on top of each other hmm. this is called turbostratic ar arrangement then so this is the difference actually between graphene and graphite. You have randomly oriented graphene 2D sheets. In the case of graphite, you have ABAB, A stacking. Okay, so that is one material. Graphene, of course, because these are sheets, they are in the form of flakes. Now, ideally, single graphene sheet or graphene, the word graphene should only be used for single layer which is defect free but that does not quite happen when we are using for all practical purposes during experiments and so on when you grow graphene using cvd you will always have a lot of defects which will change its structure which will make it slightly wavy and not uh, have this nice uh, defect free structure so you will still call it graphene even if you don't have a single layer you have more than two one or two or two or three layers you still call it multi-layer graphene now, this is debated whether or not this, uh, these terms should be used, but you can still call it multi-layer graphene when it does not have the graphite-like structure. Hmm. But let's say if you have five graphene sheets randomly organized on top of each other, then you call it multi-layer graphene. But if you have five graphene sheets, but they are stacked in an ABABA fashion, then you call it graphite. Hmm. Okay, so now that is one structure. Uh, fullerenes, you know, these are football-like structures. Hmm? They are also made of carbon atoms, but the sheets are not all six-membered. You also have five-member sheets hmm? because only then you will be able to provide the curvature. You also have carbon nanotubes. If you take the sheet of graphene and roll it up, then you will get something known as carbon nanotubes. You can have single vault or multi vault hmm? So if there is one cylinder, then it's a single vault carbon nanotubes. You have multiple concentric cylinders, then you have multi vault carbon nanotubes. So you have some of these are the examples of carbon based nanomaterials. Okay. Now, as I mentioned that when you're doing CBD or any other synthesis method, you will always have some non six membered atoms. And what does that do when you have non six membered atom in a sheet, which should only have six uh, non six membered rings, sorry, you should only have ideally six membered. Huh? What happens when you put a bigger, let's say seven membered ring in the same structure? Now you will not have the same nicely flat structure, right? It will bend slightly. Hmm. And it's hybridization also, if you now calculate, it will not be pure sp2 hybridization. Hmm. Only in the case of graphene you will have, or perfect graphite, you will have sp2 hybridization. But once you get curved sheets, and the curved sheets come because of five and seven membered rings, hmm. it can also be a bigger hole. Hmm or other kinds of defects, 
these defects will actually give curvature to your graphene sheets and that's why I have written a curved carbon sheet here. I, have I did not call it curved graphene sheet because graphene ideally should not be curved. Hmm? But you can also call it defect containing graphene sheet. Hmm? Okay. So now the again the most important part is that how do we do manufacturing using this again the most common technique used for graphene and carbon nanotubes uh, based devices is still printing so where you mix car, uh, these materials into a resin binder similar to what you do for composite making with carbon fibers right so something very similar and then you will use when they are in the micro nano scale you want to make something then you will use various printing techniques you will then also um, few things that the optimization parameters would be the viscosity of your resin depend it based on uh, the fabrication technique that you are using and also the interface properties how well is this resin mixed with your graphene sheets or carbon nanotubes because these materials typically are hydrophobic and they also um, they have a lot of surface energy so they do not mix very well they are also extremely light materials so the moment you open a box of carbon nanotubes Please don't do that without wearing a proper mask and gloves and, and uh, do it only inside a fume hood. If you open the box of carbon nanotubes, it might just come out and fly. It's an extremely light material which may also get some electrostatic charge on top of it. So there are difficulties in making a paste out of them, but this is still the most common technique. People also do some surface treatment to make these um, interfaces more susceptible to mixing. Hmm. So this is these are the things that you will typically use. For making so yeah this pyramid uh, or cone like shape you can make using graphene and binder here this is done by using 3d printing uh, nanoscale 3d printing huh? so you can also do 2d and 3d printing basically this is how it will look like okay so now do we always have devices which are just using this kind of paste uh, no in some cases there have been several examples where people made transistors using single carbon nanotubes there are uh, uh, several sensors where people are using the properties of individual graphene sheets and also sometimes they are using really they are isolating and and using a single graphene sheet but you can imagine that isolating something at nano scale is extremely difficult huh? you have to use really a lot of characterization techniques a lot of isolation techniques and um, you may also not be able to do it in one go you know you have to do it multiple times so, uh, reproducibility is an issue so these techniques become very cumbersome and very expensive and that is why it is difficult to scale them up or take them to the commercial level and that is why despite all the promising aspects and all the promising uh, properties of all these carbon nanomaterials there are very few example examples of commercialized technology but of course the research is going on and uh, maybe in the future we will have a lot of carbon nanomaterial based devices in the market.